hello everybody um, and thank you for having me here today. I hope you're, you're enjoying your lunch. Um, as uh, as um, Tom, who intro kindly introduced me, mentioned, I, I teach at the University of Waterloo. Um, and uh, I'll share with you just quickly, one of the, one of the students um, that all our students give us course reviews, right? And one of the students, one of the comments I once got is that um, um, the student wrote that if they only had an hour left to live, they'd want to spend it with me. And you kind of go, aw. And then it said, because it would seem like it lasts an eternity. <laughs> um, so if you're a little tired from lunch, I think you're in for the best nap of your life. Um, all right, so on that note, uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep you interested along the way. Um, I want to speak about housing legacy because we talk about legacy and leaving things behind to our children and future generations. We don't always think about housing as a system and as a legacy we leave for future generations to come. In this particular picture, I'm showing sort of a standard um, single family home, brick built. That is a legacy, I think that was built roughly around 1890, 1910, 1920. People live in that today, well until that high rise there came about. Um, that was a stock left over and even though I'm an advocate for densification, um, infill and so forth, to some extent we have to ask ourselves whether the legacy we received from the past actually served us very well, at least in some circumstances. The single family home is very adaptable to demographic change, to changes in household size. You can split it various ways. You can rent it. You can add, put additions on it. You can take additions off um, and, and so forth, right? I'm just putting a, an enclosed front porch in my house. And uh, from uh, Charles's talk this morning, I should have tried to convince the city with, uh, that if I have less of a setback, it actually increases the happiness of our street, right? And I might have not had to go through the minor variance I had to pay for. Um, but I'll, I'll, uh, I can vent with you later about that. Um, but the point being, we need to carefully evaluate as to what we're building today, largely, and at least in the largest cities, one-bedroom condos, and we're calling that densification and infill. What will be the legacy of that 20, 30, 40 50 years from now, right? It's harder to adapt a one bedroom condo to demographic change. Suddenly you might have larger families again, right? Who would have thought 100 years ago that one of the most largest shares of households now is the one person or the two person household, right? Might have not seen that coming, but we were able to sort of adapt to that. So anyway, so that's sort of a longer perspective of where I head to. Before I get there, I just thought I'd share with you some of the other things that I, that I work on or as they relate to this. Really in general, I would probably call myself as somebody that studies uh, the sort of the relationship between urban economies, housing, and planning, and how those three, kind of, three things fit together. Um, I've been most recently thinking about generational change because I've observed in my research that there are more divisions in our society by age than there were in previous generations. Um, society has always been segregated to some extent, right? But traditionally we thought about segregation more along class lines, ethnicity, religion, um, even gender and so forth, right? As, whereas age we hadn't thought as much about in terms of a segregating effect. Through a trend that I've been calling youthification, which is the growth of young, the share of young adults in, in the central city of large uh, metropolitan areas, has led to an increasing segregation of people by age, right? And I'm arguing then from a planning perspective, and that's sort of the headline up there from something I wrote for the Huffington Post, um, that the way we plan our cities, when we segregate our neighborhoods so much by housing type, we're also leading to some extent to age segregation. And in an age where we arguing, um, societal observers are arguing that it becomes increasingly difficult to relate to one another because everybody's you know, more focused on their own sort of niche um, as opposed to the, the bigger picture, age may become one of those variables where we start having a more difficult time understanding future generations. Uh, now, 
you're, you're probably going to say, well, there's nothing new, right? I didn't, my parents didn't understand me, and I don't understand what my kids are doing, uh, and neither, you know, neither will they with their kids, right? Generational differences are nothing new. Um, I, I'm not going to argue that. But people have argued that because the pace of societal change, so how quickly we change a society, has accelerate, accelerated, of course, so that being 30 years apart today in terms of birth date it means a lot more than it did 100, 2, 3, 400 years ago. Of course, there are always differences, but because things so changed, changed so much, right? I grew up t learning how to type on a typewriter, right? Um, and I'm, well, at least I think, I'm not that old, right? Um, but, 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 you know, the students I teach today, they never grew up without the internet, whereas I grew up without the internet, right? And, and so we can then look at all sorts of societal factors as to how that shapes our views, our understanding of the world, our values, and then also our choices about location, transportation, and housing, right? And that's where we sort of bring it back to planning. But nonetheless, just like in the literature on, on, on ethnic uh, uh, change and on, on, on racism, um, one could sort of draw on that and say, well, if we're increasingly moving different generations in different parts of the city, right? You live downtown when you're young, and you live over here when you've got a family, and we're going to put you over here when you're old, right? Um, that in of itself, well, yeah, <laughs> pun intended, right? Um, that, uh, that could lead to actually increasingly difficult uh, difficulty for us to relate to one another across age groups, because we're not exposed, so to speak, to one another, right? So that sort of draws on, on exposure theory. Now, so that's sort of the, the bigger picture of it, but today I want to talk more specifically uh, about housing, bring in some of these generational aspects, but the talk in and of itself will be a bit broader than that. It will zero in uh, very specifically on the housing uh, question as it relates to public policy. And I, I thought that would be suitable today given the, uh, given the audience and how many of you are in, uh, um, from, the, from the public sector, but also because housing inherently, I would argue, in, in, in our society does have to have a public policy dimension. And I'll, I'll you know, I'll go through a few points right now as to why I would argue that is so. The first one is that many would argue that shelter is actually a basic human need. And Canada, for those of us who've never heard about that or, you know, need to be reminded of it, we've, as a country, have actually signed on the United Nation, uh, Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And within that, housing is identified as a basic human need, right? So, at least from what you know, we've sort of agreed to as a country, we'd say, well, okay, we acknowledge as a society we need to be providing housing for people, right? regardless of whether they're able to afford it or not. So we could say, well, that's the starting point. Now, if as a society we want to debate that point, um, then we could do so as well. But I, I'd say for now, uh, until we sort of, you know, maybe we'll call the United Nations and say, well, take us out of that because we really just think people should fend for themselves, right? Um, we're not quite there yet, but certainly some of the trends we're seeing in public policy are moving in that direction, right? Where we're forgetting about home as being a basic human need. The market is not necessarily equitable. The market does a lot of things well, I would argue, but it doesn't distribute things necessarily all that equally. I might be willing to pay for the $2 million condominium development downtown Vancouver, but I'm not able to, right? Uh, even if I tried really hard. So ability to pay doesn't match willingness to pay, hence back to the point about it being a basic human need. Housing has also become, to some extent, more and more what I've called decoupled from labor markets. That means housing prices have grown at a rate much higher than what people's earnings have done. And, um, you know, sort of going to the, back to the idea that um, society is becoming more polarized, some of you have been maybe um, uh, hearing or learning about that as well over the last sort of five, ten years, there's an argument, right, that we're seeing a growth uh, of people uh, that are at the highest end of the income spectrum, growth of the people that are at the bottom end of the income spectrum and sort of a disappearing middle class, right? And what that does is that you've suddenly got all these people that are, whose earnings are actually increasing at a faster rate than anybody else's. They're able to outspend other people in the housing market. And if you're a developer, why build for that bottom end of the spectrum if they're not able to pay for it? I'd rather build for the luxury market, right? And so if we're looking for explanations as to why um, there's more um, housing built at the upper end of the market and people aren't able to afford it, we can actually go back and look at the structure of the economy and how that has structured our income distribution. So we can't forget about that bigger picture, right? Um, and also, 
you know, for those, for those of us who need uh, at least an efficiency argument, and I, I would argue with housing we don't always need it, but certainly it helps in convincing some, part, uh, some people, is that expensive housing, the research is showing, can be a barrier to growth in and of itself, right? And you might say, well, look at Vancouver, it's growing, people want to be there, um, and housing is as expensive as it can get, same with maybe San Francisco, New York, right, other Boston, places like that. Uh, but certainly the studies are finding that you're, you're losing um, some parts of the population at a critical point in time. You may gain them when they're very young and more mobile in the labor market. You lose them when they form what we might call more permanent households, right? And that's happening at a later life cycle stage than it used to in the past. But when people start having children and moving in with a spouse, um, they often want to find a larger home, right? We were having a discussion this morning about, well, how many rooms do you need? And there's sort of obviously cultural and societal differences. But generally speaking, in the Canadian context, people aren't satisfied with a one bedroom um, apartment when they're gonna have one, two, or maybe even three kids, right? Uh, and so you see this out movement of, of that core segment of the labor force that is sort of in that middle of the life cycle stage from intensified areas. You see some people coming back when they're older and downsizing, uh, but you, you're going to lose a large share of your, uh, of your labor force over time um, if you're not careful with, with how much housing costs. And then also there's all these societal costs of the poorly housed, right? Um, there is a cost to society of people who have to live on the street. There is a cost to society for those who need to get uh, medical treatment for issues associated with their poor housing conditions, right? We cannot forget about those other costs uh, and that would go away or at least be reduced if we dealt with the housing situation first. Um, the other thing I want to preface my, my talk with, right, and this is probably while you notice and start agreeing with my wife, who says your prefaces are usually longer than your lectures, and when my wife says you're lecturing, then I know I have to stop talking. Um, but the, and one more preface, and we'll get to the meat of it. Housing um, also has to be considered at different scales, right? We tend to think about housing as, as the unit, as the dwelling even of itself, and you know, this, the, that, that's kind of obviously part of it, and we have to help make sure that that part of it is affordable, but we sometimes forget that and when we talk about affordable housing, that housing also comes with a whole neighborhood infrastructure, be it roads, right, and sewers, or transit, or does it not have transit, right, and schools and so forth. And that, of course, is then part of a larger segment of the city that is connected by various infrastructures, right? And so I would argue we can't actually think about housing properly without thinking about the larger infrastructure that we're providing to people. We might be building affordable housing, um, but if it's in a place where people are dependent on a car, which we can show through the research, is going to be more expensive for them than if we built the housing near transit, then we're not really solving the affordability problem, or at least not to the extent we thought we were, right? We have to think about affordability then, not just about what you're actually paying month to month towards that housing, but also how you're gonna get around the community, right? For, because we're housing people, not just for them to stay in a house and never come out, um, that would kind of you really contradict what Charles was talking about this morning, right? We actually want them to go places. We want them to go to work. We want them to go see their neighbors. Uh, and if we're building housing in a way where that's more difficult and expensive, um, that, then that's a problem in of itself, right? So then for the rest of my, my talk today, uh, I wanna talk about four trends that I would argue that very clearly come out of the research on, on housing um, in most Western countries, I would say, but definitely in Canada and in the US, this would be more pronounced. So if we keep going, um, you know, the, the course, uh, stay the course and we don't do anything else, um, I would say our future is gonna be less affordable, it's gonna be even more uneven, it's gonna be, and already is, I would argue, less coordinated, our housing legacy, and it's gonna be riskier, right? Um, and hopefully it won't look like that. Um, that's actually a picture from the US. I was just trying to look for a picture that sort of had an impact of you know, housing's falling apart. Um, that's from uh, a US city actually during the 1960s race riots, a picture Ellen Miley at UBC took. Um, uh, and I don't wanna end on that negative note, um, partly just because I don't, feel like I'm a positive person. I want to think about some solutions, and they're going to kind of come up along the way, but in the end, I want to particularly zero in on solutions uh, that we could be considering, again, as, it, as they arise from the research.
So when we're talking about affordability, so let's look at that first uh, part of it that I, that I mentioned, right? Less affordable. Um, we have to remember that um, affordability is actually happening on a, on a housing spectrum, right? This is a, a, a graphic generated by Alan Wax, who's at the University of Toronto, and it talks about, you know, being pe people are on the spectrum from homefulness to homelessness. And one of the trends that I, I would see concerning is that when we talk about affordability today uh, in a public discourse, in the media and in the press, we're really talking much more about people's inability to move from private rental to owner occupation, right? And particularly when we talk about the young um, adult segment of the market, what we're forgetting, I, I would argue, is we're neglecting more and more, if we haven't already, is that this problem at the bottom of the spectrum hadn't gone away. And you're going to need different solutions along this, right? And if anything, because there are now affordability challenges at the sort of top, or I guess it goes left to right, not top end, on the left end um, of the spectrum, um, it means that some of that rental market that previously was available to lower income earners is going to be occupied by ever increasingly higher income earners because they can't enter the ownership market, right? So that has sort of trickle down effects, but not in the way that we're usually to told about uh, trickle down effects in, um, in, in mainstream economics. That has negative ones, right? Um, so let's keep that in mind uh, as well. So just quickly looking here at uh, two cities, this can be shown for other, um, for other cities as well and communities across Canada, uh, but these are two cities I've studied uh, in most detail most recently. And you can see here that for those 25 to 34 years old, uh, over that 20-year uh, period, you're seeing uh, you know, some increases, especially in Toronto and Vancouver, uh, in the percentage of people below that 30% cutoff that's often used uh, to, to, this, to determine whether you're, uh, you know, you're able to afford your housing. Interestingly enough though in Montreal it actually went slightly the other way. Now as many of you no, um, this ends uh, in 2006 because the data after that is just not um, available. Well, it's available, but it's useless. And I, maybe if I'm sounding a little, um, uh, you know, strong in that sense, it truly is. As somebody, you know, who's who's um, um, who works with statistics all the time, um, you can't use the, the data we have now. So that, that's a whole other point. Um, you know, I don't like this morning speaker. I don't want to get political, but politics is always behind this, right? Um, nonetheless, interesting with, about that though is that. Despite the uh, increases in affordability concerns, the ownership rate has actually gone up. Um, and so we're sort of saying, well, how does that happen? Now, I, if we looked at the chart for household debt, we'd also see that that's gone up, right? So people are actually increasingly taking on higher debt loads uh, to help pay for ownership, part uh, partly because as a society in, in Canada, maybe with the exception of Quebec, we elevate home ownership above other tenure types. And so uh, arguably, some people are actually, you know, sort of pushing themselves to achieve that dream um, beyond their financial means because culturally it's seen as a, as a higher achievement. Um, we can look at these charts then also for you know, some of the communities that are, uh, that are more closer to where we are today. And as sort of the overall trend that we have to think about at a national level is that housing affordability, as we obviously know, is more of an issue in the largest communities as opposed to the smaller ones. Because in the largest communities you have uh, higher pressures on the land markets, you have more growth constraints, you have more people moving moving in, so it tends to push up land prices and affordability concerns are, are more of an issue. Um, so you sort of see that rate uh, declining at least a little bit as you go to, to some of the smaller communities. The other thing to, to notice though is regardless of which community you look at, you know, whether it's some of those uh, communities here around Edmonton uh, or in the rest of Canada, generally speaking it's the lone parents and the non-family households that are experiencing the highest affordability uh, concerns. The other thing I want to point to though here is um, Ladue County, which I was a bit surprised by, is that actually the rate among just these, comparing these communities, the, the percentage, right, not the absolute number, of course, but the percentage of lone parents and non-family households that are experiencing affordability concerns is actually higher there than, uh, than the Canadian average and higher than in Calgary and Edmonton. Um, so I, you know, I haven't had the chance to look at in detail what's going on there, but if, um, you know, if Ladue County wants to talk, I, I might, you know, we could do a report or something. Um, it's tough times in academia, right? I have to get, get look for funding. Um, 
The other thing that's, so you know, what's causing this, right? Well, we heard this morning already, at least in session three, um, you know, and there's various ways to show this. This is total number of houses uh, built under the you know, national uh, um, housing affordability. Um, starts in 1979, you know, and then increases in the 80s, and then a sharp drop in the, in the early 90s, right? And so the, since then, we've built, I could say almost nothing, right, compared to uh, the total number of houses built in the Canadian context. And again, right, we can't just think about housing and affordable housing as being somehow separate from the rest of the housing market. There are, of course, housing submarkets, but prices are in many ways connected. Uh, and so, you know, it shouldn't be perhaps a surprise if we stopped building for those at the bottom end of the spectrum, bottom only meaning income, not some sort of societal hierarchy, um, bottom end of the spectrum in terms of price, well, there's going to be more people who can't afford things, right? That's uh, why are we so surprised by this? Um, the other things we can look at is sort of the price um, uh, for different kinds of housing. And I think one of the things that, uh, that's interesting about this is, um, and there is a lot of data here, so I'm going to try and point at some of it. Um, if we look at, for instance, in British Columbia, um, you can kind of see that ownership costs, you know, they're stayed more steady for condominiums, um, but also, you know, they've gone up for two-story and, and bungalow housing. Now, the interesting you know, thing to, to think about there in terms of the condos, if you've ever gone into a condo in, in, in Vancouver that's been built in the 80s and then go visit your other friend um, who's bought one in the 90s and then another friend who's bought one in the 2000s and so on, um, every visit you make, you're going to be in a smaller and smaller house, right, um, or condominium. So the the thing is about this, right, we're, we're seeing the price stay steady, uh, even taking a bit of a dip, but you're getting less and less housing. So what that means is that uh, it's a very different kind of segment of the population that's actually being housed. And so that's inherently one of the issues with, um, with looking at average measures like that. Well, first of all, it doesn't take scale and geography into account, right? These markets uh, are going to be very different whether you look at Vancouver here, right? You've got Vancouver escalating, Toronto staying steady, Calgary kind of going down, Montreal being much lower. So obviously it matters where you are. Um, also housing size versus demography, right? So if we're looking at the average price of units, um, we're not looking at the fact that a one, room, one bedroom apartment may not be suitable for larger households, right? And so that question of are we building affordable and suitable housing, those things have to go together, right? We can't think about affordable housing in the absence of suitable housing, which means are you building housing that is, that is um, large enough in size uh, to accommodate a range of the, of the population in terms of demographic profile? Now, of course, you can say, well, how do we determine what's suitable housing? Well, CMHC has a definition, of course, that looks at suitable housing and it defines it by a certain number of rooms in relation to your family size. And we had an interesting discussion this morning, uh, and one of the speakers actually meant, mentioned and I think I see him right over there, um, that, um, that, that that standard that's been set by CMHC can be a barrier in terms of social housing provision because it, it uh, has certain limitations in how many children you can put in a room and so forth, right? And I'm not suggesting we move to some sort of overcrowded housing standard, but perhaps we need to reevaluate those standards because they are culturally, socially, and temporally specific, right? As we're moving towards higher density cities, maybe it makes sense to re-examine how many people we think it is appropriate to have to have a room, especially when we're talking about um, um, you know dependent children. Um, also, affordability at the average ignores the housing spectrum, right? We're seeing average housing prices uh, all over the media. They're used even sometimes in policy reports. I I'm going to go out on a limb here again and use very strong wording and say it's essentially not quite useless, but almost useless because it doesn't tell you anything about the distribution of the prices, right? Your average could actually stay the same and you could have lots of affordable housing on the bottom end and lots of really expensive housing on the upper end that get the same average as if all the housing was right around the average, right? Um, and and I can sh we can prove that through statistics, but I, I'm not going to do that right now. Um, so your average could stay the same, but the distribution of units available you know, can be dramatically different. Um, and it also doesn't take into account job losses, right? One of the graphs, uh, I'm not sure how to go backwards here, so I'll, I'll just talk about it. I can't see it right now, but one of the graphs here is for Calgary, and it showed, it, particularly in recent, uh, you know, in a couple of recent years, there's been a sort of, a, in the most recent period up to 2015, uh, and, you know, in the last few months, there's been a dip in housing prices, right? And so then under these measures, you're thinking, well, that's that's great, it's more affordable now, but when we only look at the price of units, we're not thinking about the economic conditions, the labor market side of things, right? People are experiencing affordable housing issues in places like Detroit and Cleveland and other cities that have experienced dramatically declines uh, in, in housing um, 
prices. Um, and that, that's not really meaningful if you're not looking at the labor market situation. Are, are people who are living there actually employed? So even if you're using price to income ratio, you're not including the people who are not earning an income, right? You're not including the people who are unemployed. So the affordability will look better if you're just looking at income to, to price without considering the overarching conditions of the labor market. Um, now, so that's affordability in you know, a couple of minutes. We can, there's more to talk about there. But the, the second theme I want to go to is this sort of question of unevenness, right? And some of you might have, uh, might have heard about Thomas Piketty, a French uh, economist um, who recently wrote a book called uh, Capital in the 21st Century, not to be confused with Das Kapital from Marx, right? Um, uh, although, I think maybe not, uh, this may have been chosen with something along those lines uh, in mind because he's pointing to inherently structural issues in the economy that he's arguing are contributing to, to uh, unevenness. Now, uh, you know, I never thought I'd be standing in Alberta talking about Marx. Um, I think I'm <laughs> um, re traveling through time and space. Um, <laughs> the argument of this book is that the rate of return on capital investment has exceeded the growth rate of people's incomes. And the argument, therefore, is that those who own capital assets, which if you look at you know, society in general, most of us don't. Um, I might have you know, $500 in stock or something somewhere, so I have a little bit of capital investment. Um, but that return has been consistently higher than the growth rate in incomes. And so you see those who are owning capital, uh, income generating aspects, whether it's, you could even throw land into that in the Canadian context, um, or, and uh, are, are seeing their incomes, or at least their returns to their investments, grow at a much higher rate than those who are just working for their income, right? Um, and so he's arguing that's really contributing to a structural unevenness, and that theory is what really has received most of the attention in the media, including from you know, our, uh, Stephen Colbert, who, who made these t-shirts and said that, that all the proceeds from these t-shirts go to him so he can prove that that formula is true. Um, <laughs> But, but what didn't make as, as many headlines is the fact that sort of the back half of the book um, talks a lot more about the trends in unevenness and paints a very bleak picture as to what might happen if that trend continues, right? So we can disagree with Thomas Piketty, as many have, and I think there's probably arguments on both sides uh, to be had, but even if we disagree with his theoretical argument, the trends in unevenness, the trends in polarization in the income structure, they're not, we can't deny those because that's what the numbers show. Unless, of course, if we get rid of the census, then we won't know, right? Um, and, um, <laughs> this is not an eye exam. Um, <laughs> Um, this is a, a, a statistical analysis of people's incomes, the determinants of incomes that I've conducted for, in this case, again, Montreal and Vancouver, because I said I was earlier, I was comparing those two housing markets for almost six or seven years uh, to, to look at those cities in particular. But I since expanded some of these arguments to other communities, and this holds true across, uh, across Canada. Um, but what I want to point out is one of the findings from this, this is what, one of the findings that made it into the Globe and Mail, is that um, when we compare young adults, their earnings, uh, to young adults 20, 30 years ago. So we're not comparing um, older people to younger people. We're taking somebody who's 25, let's say, and comparing them to somebody 25 today, comparing them to somebody who's 25 in the 80s or, or you know, in the late 80s, and so and in the 70s, sort of looking through time. In this case, and just this, the numbers you're seeing is just 80s to 2000s, but you can kind of play with the time frame. In any case, what we're seeing is that somebody with the same job, the same education, the same ethnic background, the same gender, and so forth, is earning less than somebody did with that same job, the same education, and so forth in the 1980s, right? Increasing unevenness across generation. Today's young adults, despite what we might you know, label them as complaining millennials and spoiled brats, um, <laughs> no reactions, nobody have any spoiled brats at home, um, spoiled, uh, spoiled brats, um, there are numbers um, you know, underlying this debate that suggest, oh, wait a minute, 
people are earning less than previous generations are doing. And I'm always careful to say, I don't produce these numbers because I'm sort of interested in some competition about which generation had it harder, right? That's not really my intent. And I, I try to sort of stay away from that media coverage in that regard, because all I'm trying to point to is if suddenly now the young adult population in a context, as we were told in the, in the, uh, in the news story yesterday, where seniors now outnumber children, you also have a young adult labor force that's earning less than previous generations. How are you going to support healthcare, right? social programs, um, if even this generation will require more assistance, for instance, to enter the housing market? Um, this one's in yellow because it's actually a bit of a good news story, although it's not, not great yet, is that um, still, even you know, despite now 30, 40 years of, of, of gender equality movements, uh, women are still earning almost $20,000 less than men. Again, same job, same education, right? same ethnic background, and so forth. Um, this is your statistical average person that none of us really ever are, but right, you, can, you can do that analysis. Now the good news, this is where I'm pointing to the good news, is that that difference is smaller for young adults. Now part of that reason is that because earnings actually tend to diverge more over somebody's life cycle, so you actually expect gender inequalities to be smaller when people are first starting out and they kind of increase. Um, but also that you know, even as these people age, which I haven't been able to do, you know, beyond sort of their 30s, because young adults today are in their early 30s. Um, but what we're seeing is actually that, that inequality still doesn't increase as much as it has in previous generations. And of course, that kind of makes sense with uh, the policies that have been in place to try and, of course, uh, even out that gender gap. Um, and so, you know, there have been improvements since the early 80s, but the improvements have even been larger for, for the younger generations, right? So we're making some headway, but we're not obviously where we need to be in terms of gender equality. Um, university education for those you know who uh, uh, are sending um, children, uh, excuse me, to to, to post-secondary education is associated with higher earnings, despite you know the sort of anecdotal evidence we always hear that you end up working at Starbucks. I would argue um, not, there's anything wrong with Starbucks, but you want to match people's skills and education and training to to the jobs uh, that match that best, right? It's not really efficient to train people for five years and then have them do a job that doesn't acquire that training. Um, so it's not talking about whether one job is more or less important to society, but it's about finding that match. Anyways, I think I would argue that 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 sort of perception of um uh, as to um, you know, young people not being able to enter the labor market in their desired field is perhaps just a transitional question that people come out of school, they might spend a little bit of time working in a, in a job that they don't want to. And so we have to kind of look at the longer term picture to truly talk about whether people with university education are having trouble getting into the field that they desire. And I think overall, the stats actually point that people do end up in, in the desired careers for the most part. But also as I'm able to show here in, in these stats is that university education continues to be associated with higher earnings, holding other factors constant. And this is where this relates to unevenness again, aside from you know, the, the gender and then the generational unevenness, is that uh, um, this effect of university education on incomes has actually increased over time. So somebody with a university education today is earning relatively more than somebody with a high school degree that difference today is larger than it was in the 70s and in the 80s, right? The good news is that we have more people with university education today. The bad news is that if you're not in a university or in the college, which the effect is not quite as large as with the university on incomes, but it's certainly they are compared to those with high school or no high school. If you've only got a high school diploma or, or less in terms of educational attainment, um, you're relatively earning less today um, than you were in the, in the past, right? And so again, I point here to the labor market because we're talking about housing affordability and this unevenness can help us understand that some of this has less to do with housing, it's part of it, but as much to do with the structural changes in our economy that are leading some people to fall behind, right? And, and so when we look to solutions uh, for our housing affordability concerns, we cannot just look to housing. We have to think about the labor markets as well. One of the issues is that within government, right, and even within research fields, um, people study housing, people do policy on housing, and people do policy on the labor market, right? We need to bring those two things together more often, right? And that's part of my research agenda is to look at, well, how do we actually do that? Um, here, just some other stats, and this is, I think, in the interest of, you know, talking about um, the, uh, the, the 
um, different kinds of generations that, that, are, uh, that are affected by this unevenness. Uh, again, just the two cities pulled out, but we can show this for other communities as well. Um, the first thing to note is that if you just look at 2006 in, in Montreal, um, that uh, th this uses a Gini coefficient, and I'm just going to for those of you who are not familiar, um, it's a measure of uh, inequality, and for the purposes here, we just say the higher the number, the higher the inequality, the lower the number, the lower the inequality. And if, if you'd like me to talk more about that, I'm, I'm happy to do that after. Um, what we're seeing is that inequality within age groups um, is actually um, higher among those 65 and over than it is for the young adults. Right? So you have a wider spread in the income and distribution for older people. This is very problematic. This is a trend I've been trying to point to uh, for, for at least a year and a half now um, because the dominant narrative, and narratives matter even when they're not necessarily true, the dominant narrative in policy circles and in the media is that the baby boomers have equity and they're rich. Uh, that's true for part of them. There's going to be a share of baby boomers who are going to retire and not have sufficient money to actually pay for themselves or their health care needs or other uh, support systems when they retire. To assume that you know, the baby boomers all have equity is to ignore that um, the income distribution is, is very widely spread. That's sort of one way to interpret that. So there are going to be poor baby boomers, and we have to pay attention to that. Um, the other thing to notice is that um, well, yeah, this difference, right, uh, over time. So not only in the 80s was there, dis was there a spread between uh, the higher and the lower income earners among those 65 and over, but that division has actually become larger, right? So the difference in income between the poorest and the highest earning 65 and over has become larger today than it was in the 80s and 70s, right? The poorer person is relatively poorer today than they were historically. Um, if you go far enough back, right, relativism uh, will suggest that we're always going to find a poorer person in history that we can point to and say we're relatively well off today. Um, that's a dangerous way of making public policy because you're, you're basing it basically on the lowest common denominator, right? Um, look past to what society had achieved at one point. Can we return to that, right? Um, now, also more even is the equity distribution by communities. And you may even observe some of that, even within your metropolitan region here. Um, these are two pictures from a, from a chapter I co-authored with Andreas Kaberskis, who's in the planning department at uh, Queens. Um, these are houses uh, on uh, Gaspé Peninsula in Quebec, and they sold, at least at the time of writing, for about $50,000 a piece, single-family homes. This is a, a, a house in Vancouver that, uh, in the Dunbar neighborhood that was at least a million dollars right um, probably about similar in quality so the the key thing here is that um, small town equity doesn't buy you big city homes right and why is that a problem well it's actually a labor mobility it's a macroeconomic issue because if people can't move from one part of the the, the country to another when they're um, wanting to move because of job or even family related reasons um, you can't do so because you're not able to actually necessarily sell your home but even if you're able to sell your home how are you going to buy into the Vancouver market, let's say, if you had a $50,000 home, uh, if you were coming in from, from that part of Quebec. It's also an issue for labor retention, right? The higher priced homes, it often means that housing sizes are generally smaller. It means that as people are starting to grow their household sizes, uh, as they sort of you know, move beyond the young adult stage, they tend to move to, to some of the smaller communities. And, you know, and so then, you could actually, in terms of planning for housing in the long run, and I think we're starting to see that, but I would argue that the trends are actually pointing to smaller communities uh, seeing, uh, going to be seeing a growing influx of retirees and young adults. Retirees, because some of them won't be able to actually sustain their housing because they're not going to be that uh, you know, well off in the big city when they are not having that steady income stream, uh, but also just those who downsize or might look for a, for a, you know, maybe a quieter life than they were used to in the large metropolitan areas. But I would also argue the young adults, because many of them aren't going to find the housing size they desire in a location they desire. Right? Many of the young adults today are exhibiting patterns of moving close to amenities, right? And in smaller communities, you can actually still afford that. Of course, the amenities are very different. Um, but my argument here is that if a, as a smaller community, 
community, you can make your downtowns attractive to these segments of the population, um, you know, make at least your, your inner cities walkable, you're going to be on the receiving end of a population influx, as opposed to if you're just, uh, you know, a, another sprawling suburb outside a metropolitan area. Um, Richard Shearmore is an economist and geographer at McGill University. Um, he looked at predictors of growth, I think almost over 30 years, across all of, Can all of Canada's communities and said, what were some of the most important predictors of growth? Um, and when you look at outside the metropolitan areas, the biggest predictor of growth was being close to a metropolitan area. Um, and that's both in terms of population and economic prosperity. So when I've given, not this talk, but a similar talk once in Thunder Bay, uh, which is in northern Ontario, uh, and you know, it's about a three-hour flight uh, from, from Toronto, um, I was telling them, so what do, you, what do you do, right? You pick up the town and you move it down to southern Ontario? No, you don't do that. Uh, but you think about connectivity on a larger scale, right? Are you plugged in to what's happening in the larger cities? Are you providing things that maybe somebody who's a teleworker who can work at a distance is able to access that digital infrastructure? But certainly if you're close to a metropolitan area, like many of you are here, um, you would you could expect more growth uh, than you might have in the past. Um, also in the more unevenness category, um, this, um, and again, I didn't expect you to see all the details of it. The point here is that if it's red, it's more recently developed. If it's yellowish and then bluish, it's older. So the blue stuff um, has been built sort of pre-1946 and the red stuff uh, in the 2000s. Uh, and so I talk about unevenness here um, in the sense that, you know, we've been talking about sustainable communities for some time now in Canada and in other countries, um, but it's becoming, I would argue, more uneven across Canada as to whether you have access to the kind of infrastructure that we're arguing people um, should be using, whether it's transit, being able to walk or cycle, um, or just other kinds of amenities like proximity to school and, and healthcare, um, and that that's becoming more uneven because what's being built in some cases, uh, you know, in the, in the newer areas um, is, is a lower density, and even if it's at a higher density, it's not built in conjunction with transit, generally speaking, um, as opposed to what's being built in the center, which you've only got a few red dots here in, in downtown Edmonton, um, that is being built for this, right? So you're getting kind of a, a, a greater unevenness in terms, of, um, in terms of amenity provision, thinking about it at a larger scale of infrastructure as well. This is even uh, more pronounced, uh, this is the, the greater Toronto area, uh, where you're seeing that kind of play out. Uh, we'd have to zoom in, but there's lots of red dots right there downtown. Um, including my really seemingly shaking hand, um, um, where all the new condo developments are happening, right? And then all the rest of it is happening at the outskirts. So sometimes when people, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a planner, so I, I feel like I can make um, fun of planners. Planners often celebrate um, their achievements and they point to the downtowns, but there has been as much and actually more growth in the form of what we are not trying to achieve, right, on the, on the outskirts. And I'm not arguing that growth out here is, is inherently bad, but it's the way that growth has been proceeding that has led to higher infrastructure costs, like Pamela Blay, for instance, has been um, able to show in her book um, that looks at the, the funding of infrastructure in different kinds of density context, right? You save on money generally the research shows if you build at a higher density, if you build in existing centers and uh, then at the outskirts uh, of the city. Um, and then also that sort of translates, uh, you know, in, in terms of growth, in terms of housing types. You see, I mean, there's obviously some multifamily dwellings uh, in and around metropolitan region, but generally the, uh, the multifamily and the high-rise structures, which is here in yellow, and the bluer it gets, the more single-family home-like you are, um, in very general terms. Um, this is sort of a central city phenomenon, right? And so this is partly the trend that's contributing to sort of that segregation by age um, and by life cycle stage and demographic groups because the smaller households, for them, were building high-density stuff in the center and not really elsewhere, right? And so if you're somebody who's trying to capitalize um, on, on growth of some of these segments here and actually attract a young labor force that you might want in your community, you'd have to think not only about, um, you know, will they come here, but also can we build a type of housing that, that they might find uh, attracting. Um, so less coordinated, um, that's my other theme, and I'm not going to spend as much time on this, and I think I may have one or two many slides in here, so I might skip through something, but uh, if we're talking about um, being less coordinated, I first want to point to what some of the 
reasons are behind the affordability concerns, right? Um, and that will lead us to thinking about the, the lack of, of coordination. So this, this is, you know, nothing new, and it's the income polarization I've just been talking about saying, so, you know, societies become more uneven, that means for the bottom end, um, it's going to be less affordable. Demand for urban amenities, right? We actually often overlook that. There's more people who are wanting to live in the center of big cities, our, our, our studies would show. Uh, and so that demand in and of itself will rise prices. Uh, there's population growth, of course, and, and land use restrictions to some extent. Foreign investment has been receiving a lot of press in, in Toronto and the West Coast um, uh, as well. But I would argue that predominantly, one of the reasons um, why housing is no longer as affordable to a larger share of the spectrum is the dismantling of what we might have called at one point the resemblance of actually a coordinated housing system. Um, so I would argue, and I mentioned this to a, to a reporter that other day, and, and she writes great stories, but I was a, a little bit, uh, you know, she was asking me about foreign investment, and I said, yes, that's a story, but the story you should be printing is with a headline of failure of domestic policy to deal with housing affordability issues. That didn't make the headline, right? It's a better headline now to say it's foreign investment. Um, but as a share of our overall housing market, this is much more important than, let's say, a smaller share of, of, of foreign investment flowing in. And of course, the importance of that foreign investment also depends on, on where you are in Canada. Um, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is basically, um, and you'll be able to get these slides online, walking us through, uh, and there's a, a, a nice book that actually walks you through all those changes in, in policy from a very coordinated to a very uncoordinated housing system where we really, and this line is often used, um, is we're a nation without a federal housing policy, right? And then we're actually pretty much the only one in, um, among the, the, the you know, the G7 or the, the, the um, among OECD countries, right? So um, cities like Toronto and many other places as well are responding to this by saying this is an attempt to get people um, to think about and vote with attention to actually what they're calling closing the housing gap. They're pointing to the increasing need of a social and assisting housing uh, and are saying they just can't raise property taxes to a level where they'd be able to pay for that, right? And that's sort of the outcome of years of downloading and balancing budgets at the federal level uh, in then uh, just downloading uh, social services without uh, adequate funding. I'm not just asserting that. That's been written about and researched, uh, you know, in many places. Um, and that, you know, our outcome basically of, of balanced budgets at the federal level is severely constrained municipalities that are now expected to deal for, uh, with all kinds of social services that they weren't in the past. So we've really, you know, we've basically, uh, we've balanced the budget on the backs of others. We really didn't balance the budget, so to speak, right? Um, well coordinated. I, I, um, you know, I want to get to this a little bit. Partly, this is now my less of my economist talking and more of the land use planner. Um, and also, I did want to show some pictures. Um, this is in, uh, in Waterloo. I live in Kitchener, and this is in Waterloo in Ontario. It's about an hour and so uh, west, of, uh, west of Toronto. This is a senior's home that's been there for a little while. Um, it's right across the street from, from the city of Waterloo Park, um, and quite literally, so this is the, you know, the sidewalk in front of this uh, uh, home right here. And well, the reason I point to this is because, and I don't think it was actually as planned as I'm gonna make it seem it was. Um, the reason I point to it is though it so happened in circumstances and location choice that you're really close to green space. Um, that you have a range of housing types. So these actually range from small bungalows to this kind of style of living, um, apartment living. And it also ranges from people who just want to move in and downsize to you know, assisted care on, on the sort of other end of, of the healthcare spectrum. Um, and there are assisted units in there as well, I believe, for people with you know, lesser means. But I point to it as the land use planner, right? And we've even got accommodation here saying seniors crossing. I don't know, that's, I don't know what to think about that really, actually. I don't know if that's so... Um, is that ageism? I'm not sure. Um, nonetheless, clearly, this was planned with seniors in mind, right? So, um, and this is a, what we like to call a complete street. So you've got your sidewalk, you've got some greenery on either side, right? So if you need shade, you've got it. Uh, well, a little bit, anyways. You've got a cycling lane, you've got a driving lane, you've got a median where you can hang out, right? If cars are coming both ways, you can go halfway, you can hang out. Um, and um, as I often do, right, I'm, I, I like to, you know, I kind of go like this because I'm cycling. Uh, that's how I get to work and I have to wait in the median and I have to kind of do a sideways thing because my daughter's in the back in the trailer and the medians are often not long enough to actually accommodate a trailer. So if you're ever planning medians, think about the person with the trailer 
trailer, right? That's becoming more, more common as people are wanting to bring their kids to school in something other than a, than a car. Anyway, so then, you know, this is a, what we consider a, a complete street because it accommodates for all different kinds of kind of uses. Also, which you can't see here, this is about a 10 minute walk away uh, or five minute to 10 minute walk, depending how fast you walk from a new light rail transit system that the region is putting in place in Waterloo. Uh, and it is also five to 10 minutes away from a shopping center with a drugstore and a grocery store and clothing shops and so forth, right? This is well coordinated, but it's not just the coordination that matters of land use and transportation. It's also walkable and it's made accessible, right? And now I'm going to show you in the same city. So this way we get to pick on the city, you know, in the same city. We say we have a good example and we have a not so good example. Um, this is less coordinated and not because of the lack of coordinating land use and transit. This is a, a senior's residence as well. Um, uh, you can't see an actual building. There's part of it that's already occupied. This is a new addition happening. Um, and, you know, they've got cycling lanes here. They've got uh, even a bus shelter, right? There's express buses that, um, that have fewer stops that get you across the region more quickly. So it's not a problem of, 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 um, of providing uh, amenities. The problem is that we didn't really think about walkability and accessibility. So what's separating um, that seniors home from the amenities there, which is, you know, a lot of big box stores, is this um, what, what I'll classify as a regional road, so a, a main arterial, um, that is mainly um, the traffic control uh, option chosen here is roundabouts, right? The whole along the way, you've got a lot of roundabouts. They move traffic very efficiently. The problem is um, you're coming at 50, sometimes 60, 50 is the speed limit, I believe. Um, sometimes you come a little faster. This is a commuting route as well. Not many cars here because I took the picture at about 8.30 in the morning. Um, but, you know, once, once traffic is going here, this is a two-lane roundabout. Try getting across here, right? <laughs> um, and not only do you have to get across the first part, we do have the median, so there's something good here, right? Um, but then you're hanging out here and you're just basically waiting, thinking somebody's going to stop. But even if you start walking, uh, let's say here, right, the car sort of sipping around might not actually see you early enough, probably see you early enough to stop, but not see you early enough that you're not going to go, right? Um, at least I do that. I don't know. Maybe I'm just easily scared. Um, point being, this is more difficult to cross. Um, and what you then cross to is, is this beauty of, a, of an urban design example is that, you know, if you do get tired by after making your way through this parking lot, at least you've got some bench and, oh, look at that, some cycling, uh, some bicycle parking right there. And, it, it, you know, if it gets too hot, there's a tree here that you can sit under. <laughs> before you make your way back to the seniors' home right over here across uh, from the amenities and the parking lot, right? Um, so um, I'm not criticizing the use here, right? Often I, I would argue in planning circles, we're too concerned um, about whether it's big box stores or what kind of store. There's an argument to be made there. But on one level, as communities, we can also think about just accessibility and walkability first. You can actually build big box stores that are in a walkable environment. In some cases, that's been done with putting parking in a structure, putting in behind, creating a walkable environment where people park their cars and then actually walk from one store or another. So even if, and I would still say we have to work on our car use a little bit, but even if you're not willing to do that, I would argue you're going to need to work on walkability and accessibility for two reasons, because the two um, populations that are going to be moving into your communities are seniors who are going to need more walkable, accessible environments and young adults who've grown up in walkable, accessible environments where they're looking more, as my research is showing, um, of now I've got about a thousand surveys from across North America, young adults pointing to the fact that they want to live in places where they can walk and take transit, even if they drive every once in a while, right? I think sometimes we overemphasize that somehow all these young adults are supposed to be environmentalists. Some of them are, and we have to pay attention to the environmental issues, but we also have to, you know, not forget we can kind of make progress here without ditching the car right away, right? I think it's not all, it's not one or the other. Now, I don't have time right now. I'm running a little bit over. Um, what I want to talk about here just briefly is that um, we're forgetting also, I think, sometimes in housing policy about the risks that are, are increasing for people. This is a study I conducted with some of my master students, uh, and it's, it's published in Plan Canada, for those of you who want to read uh, more about it. This looked at um, the need for 
how do we forecast rental versus owned housing in our decisions? You know, how do, do, we, do we plan for more owned or rental units in our community in a context where there's more employment precarity? The term employment precarity, um, as many of you will know, is referred to you know, basically job in situations that are not permanent, so more contracts, more part-time work, more flexible jobs, right? Those are on the rise. What I was trying to look at in this research, based on some earlier work that said, you know, if your income stream's not steady, as we'll just know from our own, own experience, it's more difficult to get a mortgage, right? If your income steam's not steady, you're also maybe more reluctant to go buy a house if you're on a one-year contract because you don't know what your income's gonna be after that one year. So the hypothesis is that you're gonna see a growth in rental demand partly because of this growth in employment precarity. And so what you can do as a community is actually look at the segment of your labor market that is considered to be in precarious job and work that into your housing forecasts. Um, we have not come across in our research communities that have actually ever worked employment precarity into their housing forecasts. And you know, I could work you through a number of examples, but even if we just looked at the, um, the, the, the people earning less than $20,000 per year in the Toronto metropolitan area, um, that's about 260,000 and change households that are earning below that line. And we know from our stats that 5% of these people, doesn't seem like a heck of a lot, does it? 5%, um, but 5% of those people are part-time workers involuntarily, key distinction, right? We only look at those who are involuntarily part-time. These are people who want full-time work but can't find it. 5% um, of these people uh, are involuntary part-time workers. Now the ownership rate between part-time workers and full-time workers, it's 22% for full-time workers and it's 12% the ownership rate for part-time workers, right? And so what I'm suggesting is, and we can show, is that if we don't take that difference in job arrangement into account, we would actually underestimate by over a thousand units rental demand in Toronto. Over a thousand units underestimate rental demand, right? That's just by forgetting about whether somebody's part-time or full-time. Of course, we take income into account in our housing forecasts and other macroeconomic indicators, but this trend is, is increasing, and if we don't pay attention to it, we're gonna build the wrong kind of housing, right, in terms of affordability. Um, and so, and this is just for the, you know, for the lowest 20, people who are earning $20,000 or less, we're building 1,300, uh, too few rental units. So solutions, I mean, maybe the first one is an obvious one, build more, you know, coordinated, um, come up with coordinated policies, um, require a share of affordable units in new developments, uh, but we have to remember, as somebody pointed that out this morning, right, that's not necessarily a sort of a, a catch-all or a, a silver bullet, because when you do that, you also increase uh, development costs. Build dedicated stock, we used to do a lot more of that, that requires generally senior level of funding, there's reluctance to that, um, because I, I would argue there's sort of a hegemony of, of balanced budgets, right? And I was talking to somebody uh, today over lunch about how somehow as individuals, we don't really have problems borrowing for our house because we realize a house is sort of a long-term investment and so we take debt. So almost all of us, well, maybe I shouldn't make assumptions, at least me and most of us uh, will have debt. We'll actually be, um, you know, our, 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 um, our budgets are not gonna be balanced as governments like to claim um, because we invest in certain things that we know are gonna help us along the way. Um, the drive for balanced budgets is sort of saying, well, you could never buy a house as an individual and borrow money to do so, right? Um, but the other side of it is you obviously don't borrow money, or you shouldn't, um, to buy running shoes or a big screen TV the long-term investment of that, until, unless you get paid to watch TV or go for runs, is very minimal, right? And so in government spending, I think we have to increasingly have a dialogue, not around balanced budgets, but around what are investments that are gonna pay off in the futures, and what is spending that doesn't have that payoff. And um, you know, even, again, I turned to the session this morning where people are showing, well, larger investments today in social housing could actually save you money in the long run, and you'll have to um, um, talk to the speaker from this morning to get more details on that, on that forecast, but it makes intuitive sense uh, to say that. Um, we should look to new financing mechanisms, right? That's partly the issue is that we're sort of just, we've come out of periods of basically just federal hand downs. And so once those dried up, I mean, we might have to look at things like tax increment fan financing. Um, some, you know, people are argue, also arguing communities could actually ac ac um, acquire land as part of transit investments or as part of other uh, public investments that are being made, whether it's maybe in a, you know, in building a hockey stadium and developing a park, um, in, uh, in building a transit stop, 
you buy housing when it's, uh, you buy land when it's still cheap, you add the amenities, and then you can do something with that land as a government. And you know, as we've learned again this morning, which I guess we should just all go into this morning session in, 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 in room three, um, is that um, uh, land has become such a, a you know, higher portion of our housing costs. So if government can get in and, and buy land before it appreciates, and that still exists, uh, we can keep it at a lower price. What I hear from developers, um, one of the big things that I, that I get out of conversations from developers is that development charges um, really need to be lower if people, you know, if, we, if, if regulators want us to build rental and, uh, or co-op housing, they're arguing that's definitely a, a barrier to it and that, that, that obviously depend, depends on the context. These developers are mainly from uh, southern Ontario where that seems to be a, an issue. Also that they're saying that even, and this is from people who have been trying to build affordable housing or have done so for the past 20, 30 years, are saying it's becoming, and this is market affordable housing, right, um, becoming difficult for them to do so because the income of renters is just getting so low um, in comparison to the price that they find it difficult to make any profit. Now you say, well, of course, right? They're always going to say they're not making enough profit. Um, but certainly, you know, even um, you can kind of show even sort of on back of the envelope uh, calculation, if you look at the market price and if you look at development costs, it's pretty hard to make that case work if you move the income down to 30, 20, 10,000, right? And there are segments of our population that are earning at that, that level. Um, so um, this one, okay, I don't think, am I out of time? Yeah, okay, so I'm going to skip that. Um, so I'll end with this, and, um, you know, hopefully, I always say it, uh, the success of a talk is kind of measured by Hopefully some of you are saying, oh, he's confirming what I knew to be true, and yay, yay, yay. Some of you are saying, hmm, something interesting and new that I can take away, and some of you are saying, he's wrong and I disagree, and here's why, right? That's part of a healthy talk, is that it's a dialogue. Uh, but what I would urge us to do is whether we agree with certain kind of solutions or others, we need to come together and talk about housing, right? As if it is, and not as if it is, but it needs to be, a priority at all levels of government. Um, I'll end with a, with a quick story here. Um, I was buying groceries um, not too long ago, a couple weeks ago, and um, the, the cashier was kind of a little bit spaced out, and I, I sort of said, um, um, you know, good evening or something, I think it was after work, and uh, she didn't really respond, and about three minutes later, after scanning a few items, she sort of checked back into the world um, and said, oh, I'm sorry, I was just thinking about the 60 million lottery um, this evening, I bought a ticket, and she's it's like, I'm daydreaming about what I would do with it, right? And I thought, okay, uh, I'm curious to know what she's going to tell me. And what she told me was that she'd been hearing about people being displaced out of some of the homes where development is occurring along the light rail transit development. She'd heard about the waiting list of social housing in the region of Waterloo. She'd heard about from some friends who just couldn't pay for things. With her $60 million, she was going to build affordable housing in Kitchener-Waterloo. Now, two lessons from this. There are good people. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, and I felt bad because in my mind I thought she was going to say yacht or travel or, you know. Um, no, she was going to give it all away for affordable housing. But the other thing I would say this points to is wording that's been in some of the halls here, you can see it on the signs, probably because some of this is actually recreational rooms. It says, um, enter at your own risk or something along those lines. That's become the state of our Canadian housing market. Risk is individualized. You're on your own. It's a bit like a lottery. And we have half people talking about using lottery winnings to help people afford housing. We all might have different values. This is where I move from the research to being subjective. I say that's wrong. We don't want to build a nation where people are living on the street. Thank you very much. Thank you.